welcome to Hannah's heart. So Hannah, she's just one of the women who did struggle with infertility in the Bible. No matter who we are, we can be inspired by the fact that Hannah took her pain to God and God heard her and was with her. So when she was praying at the temple, she had been weeping and not eating and her lips were moving, but her eyes were closed and the priest was like, hey, why are you drunk at the <laughs> temple? Because yeah. it can become an obsession when you want Wanting a child so deeply. And desiring that baby and to be a mama. Every holiday, every Mother's Day. This is not a show that's going to promise you a certain outcome, mm -hmm. but this is a show that says however God answers your cry, we know that he's enough. Good morning, I'm Kendra. And this is Jade. And you're listening to Hannah's Heart on American Family Radio. And for some of you, it's not morning. We pre-record the show. I should start with that. It could be that. afternoon or evening. It or could night. Be. You we can we think about everybody. Whenever you want to on st AFA streaming where That's you can true. watch the video. That's true. <laughs> Look hey, how I We're pretty high tech. I like how you did that. Right? Yeah, you, you, you tagged in <laughs> AFA stream. Yes. Dot com, dot net. Uh, oh, AFA Lord, streaming. Look, Mark's, <laughs> the producer, Mark's like, I need y'all to get it together. If we're we're going to put yeah. it in the comments. Yeah, yeah. we'll put it in the comments. Anyways, hey. for those that are new to our show, yeah. this is a show for couples struggling with infertility or miscarriage or infant loss, mm -hmm. or um, maybe your family has been led to adoption and God is um, building your family in different ways. We know that that journey it's something. Oh, <laughs> it, it will sanctify you. Yes. <laughs> it really does. Thank you for saying that. It that does. is so Which true. Which is a good thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and today's guest that we have on um, certainly has experienced yeah, that sanctifying process. And I, I told her this off air. You have earned the right to speak into some of us, mm. into our lives because of the grief that you've gone through yeah. and the way that you have clung to Christ. So today's story is going to be an infant loss story. I know for some of you that may have experienced that recently, mm. it may be too raw to listen to this episode, but for anyone who can, I encourage you, mm. this episode is going to be hard to hear some things, yeah. But the grace of God is going to ooze out of this story mm -hmm. in a way that makes the veil between heaven and earth, like we think of it as this huge divide, like it's going to it's gonna change the way you view eternity when that. you listen to this episode. Yeah, I'm excited. It's good. It's going to draw us closer to the throne. Yes. I believe that. Yeah. Okay, so today's guest yeah. is Emily, listen to this last name, Borkenhagen. <laughs> um, is I, that German? Yeah, tell us, Emily. Emily what which are you? Hi. Yeah, it's primarily German. Apparently it's a city in Germany where I guess my husband's family originally came from. I don't know. What can I get? Okay. I can't forget that. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> but um, Emily is a dear friend of mine who used to live in this area, has since moved. Um, I I don't even remember where I first met you, Emily, but I know that where we really got to spend a little time together, we filmed something here at American Family Studios, mm -hmm. um, a, a, a movie, get this, about someone struggling with infertility before I ever knew that that was going to be a part of my journey. I was my directing Lord. the movie. I was wow. asked to do something on that theme for AFA. And her wow. little son was one of the babies, uh, one of our set babies. And I call her all her kids the Borkin babies because <laughs> they are the cutest children yep. you will ever meet in your life. And every single one of them could be a Hollywood star star but praise god she did not <laughs> send them into the the lion's den yeah that, but yeah, uh, yeah. anyways they did a great job the film's called paper dream emily welcome to the show hi thank you for having <laughs> me i really appreciate it okay so quick background you <clears throat> have um five beautiful borkin babies living on this earth they are give us the rundown of their ages real quick now yeah Allie is 20 elliot oh. is 18 20 Gabe is 16 Emily, you Lincoln sound young. Is almost 14. And how old is Silas? Silas is 10. They aren't babies anymore. Girl, that's <laughs> they were German babies when you left. Yeah. They are not. They're going to have babies of the own I soon. Said, how long are they? Really You're they, giving your age. I am. I am. Yeah. Okay, so we're going <laughs> to jump right. always be my baby. Oh, <laughs> amen. Quick, quick background. You met your husband, Tim, when, and got married pretty, pretty little, right? Yep, we met when we were both in high school and started dating when we were both 18, got married at 20, and sort of hit the ground running. So I love it. 24 years ago that we've been together. And wow. having having children has always been a passion of yours? What was that? I'm sorry. Um, having children has always been a passion of yours? Oh, absolutely. I always wanted to be a mama since I was little. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of little brothers, and uh, it was just always something that I wanted to be and wanted to do is just 
I was born as a mama pretty much. It's true. I have seen you with them. You're an incredible <laughs> mama. Well, I want to hone in on a very specific part of your story today, um, and that is the story of Poppy. And um, this happened after after you moved from here, and I've been watching on social media as you have grieved and you have clung to Christ through one of the darkest things any parent can go through. So let's just start um, with um, the beginning of Poppy's story. Um, okay, let me think where the beginning is. Well, I was pregnant. We were very excited to welcome a sick fork and baby into our family. And um, I have my first five children at home with a midwife. And um, actually, two of my greatest fears were having hospital birth and losing a child. So God mm. was kind of like, okay, let's just hit both those in one mm. shot. Um, because, you know, he has his ways of drawing us near to him quickly. Yeah. And um, so I had a hard time finding a midwife because I had high blood pressure, even though it's controlled. And midwives don't like high-risk mamas for home birth. So um I went to a birth center and they wanted me to have a backup doctor and blah, blah, blah. I had an ultrasound. And instead of finding out that we had a healthy, um, completely whole baby, we found out that we had a myriad of problems um, that were not compatible with life wow. pretty much. Her chance of living was very, very slim. Oh. We found right from the get-go she had heart problems and um, kidney issues and facial deformities, the whole body deformities, um, stomach issues. It was just so, so many things right away. I remember the ultrasound tech just saying, Oh no, mm. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And, um, it was a very sobering moment for us. So, so you, um, so you were told at that point that this, like, what were the, the expectancy for, for Poppy? Um, it was ranging at that moment. They weren't sure what she had because she had so many different things. It didn't really fit in any syndrome that anyone really knew. Mm. We were really hoping it was Down syndrome. Um, but after having our amniocentesis, we found it was Pallister-Killian syndrome, which is a very, very rare chromosome disorder um, of the 12th chromosome. And um, it's there are children that have it, have a very mild version that have lived a couple of them into adulthood, but it's very rare. And, uh, most of them don't even make it through pregnancy and Poppy was not expected to make it through birth. Mm. My Lord. Well, I'm so curious. She was oh, like I'm one in 300 million with all of the issues that she had. Wow. Very rare. Wow. Wow. I'm I'm curious, uh, Emily. Man, this already I'm like, wow, this is heavy. Where did you come up with the name Poppy? I'm curious about that. So I'm trying to think of. I think we had given her just this nickname in utero, Poppy. And um, at one point, after we found out everything was happening, we thought, you know what, it would be neat for her to keep that name, Poppy. And so we decided to do that. And then her name was Poppy Joy. And one of the kids said, you know, could we name the baby Joy? And we said, yes, absolutely. We can name the baby Joy. So she became Poppy Joy. So speaking of your kids, so you go and you have this doctor's appointment. And then, like, you have five siblings that are so excited yeah. about welcoming another baby into the family. How did the Lord guide you through that process of telling them mm. your diagnosis? Well, we are a very, very open family. Um, That's good. We are, all our kids are very close to us. There are no subjects that are taboo in our house um, or anything that's TMI. Um, so they were with us at the second ultrasound. At the first one, we just came home and said, you know what, guys? We have some bad news where there are some issues with the baby, and we don't know what they are yet, but we're going to get it checked out. And just from the get-go, we're just really honest with them and telling them, all right, we need to start praying for this situation because we have some problems and they're really bad. And, um, and immediately just went into truth and um, complete transparency. So everything we found out, they were either with us or came home to expectant ears, wanting to know what's happening next. And we all prayed together as a family through everything all the kids were at the hospital when I had her. Allie, my oldest, was actually at her birth. 
she was at the birth of all of her siblings. So um, it's just, we do things as a family. We homeschool, we life school, we do everything as a family and I, we don't hold things back from them. So mm, we I didn't like hold that. any of this back from them either. Emily, I'm, I'm curious about, I'm just, cause I love you that you say you're transparent. So this is a tough question. I will, and I, I believe you'll be honest with this because I think when, when marriages and, 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 and mothers are desiring to have a child or have lost a child, my question, are, were you angry with the Lord? Because he's sovereign, right? Like, are, were you angry with him? Or you are your children? I was. I feel like um, it would be a lie to say if, if, if someone wasn't angry at some point when yeah. something like that happens. But God can handle our anger. Come on, Emily. <laughs> just like, can be angry with a spouse or we can be angry with our parents. God, God is a relationship, has a relationship with us or should anyway where we can be honest with our emotions and our feelings with him as well. So absolutely, I was angry, and we worked that out. And, you know, I gave him my anger, and, and I screamed into pillows, and absolutely, I was angry. But that didn't change my relationship with him or that he's sovereign or that he knows what's happening. Just like we could be angry with a parent hmm. and absolutely. still trust that they have our best interests at heart and that they know what's best for us and that they have a plan, even if we can't see it. Hmm. Mm. So oh how far along were you when you got the the information that this baby is probably not going to make it through birth? Um, I was 20 to 22 weeks with the first ultrasound, and then we had to wait till for a while um, to get the next one. So I was I was in the mid 20s, I would say, when we found out that it was so severe that there was just basically no chance. I mean, when we had our first appointment with my care team at uh, a big hospital in Milwaukee. Uh, we had fetal concerns and a big, I mean, we had a whole team just for this baby. Mm. And I mean, the doctor that we had, that sort of headed everything up, very natologist was like, uh, let's just induce you now and get this over with. I mean, Girl. he was really heartless and um, just wanted to finish this. Like, let's just, why are we even waiting? Like, I, this baby's wow. going to die, so let's just get it over with now. And uh, later found out that he had the nickname Dr. Death and the Terminator because of how many babies he would kill legally um, through palliative induction. And um, and then I found out, too, that he was the medical director of Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin. Stop. And um, it made me question a lot of stuff later. Um, but I also knew that we were under God's care and yeah. um, the you know, they tell us we have was pro-life and my nurse ladies I was pro-life and we, um, we had people on our side. So God definitely protected us from this guy. You said he, he would, indu- did, what was the term? Palliative induction? Palliative induction. So they, if they believe that a baby was incompatible with life, instead of just waiting and seeing what God had to say about it, um, he would induce the mother and she would just birth the baby and they would let it die. Wow. As opposed Ooh, to... Girl scripture that says that every day ordained for you was written in his book before one of them came to be. So, okay, Emily, some, some people would say, Emily, it would have been a lot easier for you emotionally when you found that news to just go ahead and, you know, induce, then you can process your grief. The baby's going to pass anyways. Why did you make the difficult choice of, no, I'm going to stay in this labor as many days as God desires this baby to live? Um, and I actually was told that I was told that I was selfish and it was oh selfish of me to stay pregnant with her and selfish. force her to live. Um, afterwards, I was told that I was selfish in doing that and um, that abortion, even though it wasn't, abortion is not legal at the weeks I was, but this doctor made it, found a loophole in palliative induction. Um, oh. And I, I'm not God. So I told the doctor when he suggested we just get it over with i told him i am deeply pro-life and i will never do anything to purposefully hurt this baby and i will you know stay pregnant as long as uh physically able to carry this child and um and i'm not god and i also knew that what you know if i got got rid of her at that moment i would not have had the beautiful moments of feeling her move inside me Mm. and swim around and me and and the kids wouldn't have been able to feel her and Mm. talk to her and sing to her 
And we bonded with this baby in a way that I never could have imagined bonding with a, a baby in utero, honestly. We really were intentional about, I mean, we couldn't get to know her in a traditional way, but we did. We knew this baby, and, and I believe she knew us. And the kids would drive cars on my tummy, and mm. we, we spent time with her as much as we possibly could. Just like if we had someone who was dying of cancer or something, we would spend every minute with them that we could. Mm. We did the same thing with this baby, and I didn't want to waste any time and get rid of her you know, early. Emily, I just, girl, I have not had children yet. And I'm just so moved. Just mm -hmm. that would have been a lot to deal with. Mm -hmm. My question also, I just, First of all, you're just a beautiful woman. <laughs> Can I just say that? You're a beautiful woman. I, I, I didn't even met you, but I'm like, this is just a beautiful woman. Um, how how was your marriage in the midst of this? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because I could see how the enemy could have tried to bring division between mm -hmm. you and your honey. How, how did you and your husband stay tight? You know, I think God just really protected us. Um, we went to him together all the time. We are a praying family. We're a praying couple. We've been praying together every day since we were dating. Um, we've always made it very intentional to have God as the center of our marriage. And I think that it was just one of those things where the Holy Spirit just really, really protected us. Mm -hmm. And instead of fighting each other and um, pushing each other away, we clung to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really didn't have any problems in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. I feel like we have more problems over household chores probably than we ever have you too. Um, with anything with poppy like god really mm -hmm. really bound us together um and and it is all for his glory i mean and really mm -hmm. i feel like that's another miracle in the whole thing is that tim and i just got closer through it instead of far apart and i know that a lot of marriages fall apart when you lose a child or right. you know have problems with miscarriage or fertility or anything and thankfully he and i have just been more tightly bound instead mm -hmm. of apart well and you and needed I him totally because credit God for that. this this yeah. pregnancy put a lot of strain on your body talk about yep. the events that led up to um to poppy's birth so um i one of the problems with her syndrome is severe polyhydramnios which is a massively excess amount of amniotic fluid mm. in the uterus um she was six and a half pounds at birth at three 33 weeks Wow. She grew really fast, and I, she would be flipping around constantly, and I never would even feel it. I mean, she could go head down, head up, and she just was swimming constantly, and I never felt it because of how much fluid there was. I ended up having two and a half gallons of amniotic fluid in my stomach Whoa. at the end of it. Um, yeah, it was really intense. Um, but that also, I'm five foot, I was five foot tall then. And sure. I don't really even have a torso. So I'm already huge when I'm pregnant and having that much fluid. They thought I was bigger than twins, someone who was carrying twins. And you so weren't full term either. I, so. uh, wow. No, I wasn't. I was seven months when I had her, um, but I was larger than full term with triplets. And so um, wow. I couldn't lay down anymore. I couldn't walk more than a few yards at a time. Definitely couldn't get up off, off a chair by myself. Um, and so they decided to do. Um, an amnio reduction is called where they remove some of the fluid from the uterus so that you can breathe <laughs> or to function a little bit better. Um, so I had that procedure done. They removed two liters of fluid and I got really dizzy after that. And they noticed a, a, a tinge in the fluid as well that they pulled out. And I had started bleeding inside and I developed a large hematoma. And um, they just looked at me and they said, we're so sorry, but it's, it's time. You can't, you can't hold on anymore. Yeah. And it was a very sad moment for mm -hmm. me to know, okay, this is the day that either God's going to do a miracle. Mm -hmm. So that part was exciting. Or I'm going to say goodbye to Poppy. Mm -hmm. And um, so they had to induce me. Um, they had to break my waters very carefully under a team and ultrasound to let a little bit of fluid out at a time. Um, and that happened. And then that induced later on my own. I didn't have to have any drugs or anything, thankfully. Um, and then. Emily, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to. 
I'm going to have to fast forward you because I really want yeah. you to get to the core of the story here. And we only have a few more minutes left. Yeah, yeah. So y- you okay. ended up having um, to give labor. Um, you had a water birth. Yes, I have a baby. And Poppy and was born. Well, first water birth. Let's, let's go to the moment yeah. Poppy comes out. <laughs> yeah, so she came out purple um, mm. and not breathing. And I mm. looked at the nurse midwife they gave me, which is kind, and said, she's gone, isn't she? And she looked at her and me and she said, yeah, she is. And then in God's magnificent mercy, she gasped <laughs> and took a breath. <laughs> and um, God breathed life into that baby. I know it was for me. It was a gift for me. And she lived for 59 minutes. Um, during that time, I got to hold her right away. <laughs> and then my husband got to hold her. And all my children got to hold her. We passed her around. Um we dedicated her to the Lord. We passed her there, our pastor was there, and then we uh, sang to her, well, to God, really, but I sang Revelation song to her a lot when I was pregnant, so we sang it in the hospital room as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was telling you this, Kendra, mm-hmm. too, and I've told many people, like, I really like to think that she heard that song, which is straight from Scripture, um, on earth, and then when she died, immediately heard it in heaven, mm-hmm. in the throne room, and I just really that's an imagery I just really like and it's calling to me um that song is very special to us so Mm -hmm. when she died I was holding her and I just felt her spirit leave Mm -hmm. and I said to the nurse I think she's gone now Mm -hmm. and the nurse checked her and confirmed that that was true and um it was just a very sad mixed with joy somehow Mm -hmm. experience joy because we know that she was finally whole and healed and yes, God Lord. had answered our prayers with a yes, yes and we Lord. asked him to heal her it was just looked differently than we had expected and wanted mm. that transition from earth to heaven that you just ex- like that because that song is all about what they're singing around the throne room of God like you had to feel in that hospital room like heaven was so close Emily <laughs> did it feel like that Absolutely. to you Yes, I feel like the Holy Spirit was very, very present in that room with us. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone there has talked about it for years, about how God was with us, Mm -hmm. and that when she died, it was, I know it's so cliche to say it was peaceful, but there's no other way to explain the peace that we had. It was just completely God surrounding us and in us and through us, and when she she went, she went up in love. Her whole life was was in love, Mm -hmm. her whole time out of the womb was surrounded by love and then she entered pure love and uh, I am really thankful for that. Um, really quickly you had a, a photographer and one of the pictures of anyone seeing or streaming that they, they mm-hmm. see of you and Poppy together that was there that came and took pictures of you and Poppy together in the family. Why do you think it's important um, for those of us that haven't suffered what you did to, um, to understand a mother's desire to, to hold on to these memories and to show the world that this child lived? Um, I think that, you know, we, when you have children and you want to take every picture of every moment, so you don't forget anything. It's the same type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I have pictures of her alive. I have pictures of her after she died. Yeah. I wanted every moment to be captured mm-hmm. on film when I forget or when the devil tells me, whispers things and, and tries to make me forget I have photos to remind me of how beautiful it also was. It wasn't just sorrow. And um, now I lay me down to sleep is an amazing organization that provides that for families. Mm -hmm. Um, And our photographer was through them. She was a volunteer and she was with us for dozens of hours. Came back Mm -hmm. the next day. I am still in contact with her. She's a dear Mm -hmm. friend of ours, a family member, if I can say that. And, um, And she provided us with it's not, they're not just photos, they're memories Amen. captured in something we can see. And I'm yeah. so thankful we have those. Emily, thank you so much for sharing this story. We're going to play a little bit of that song that meant so much in your all's journey, just to close out the show. Thank you so much for being vulnerable. Anyone yeah. who's listening right now, I want you guys to worship as you hear this and know that in the midst of great tragedy, God offers great peace and great hope to those that trust in him. Emily, thank you so much for Thanks sharing so much. your story. Thank you for having me. You know, grief and joy can exist on the same plane. It's okay. Amen. Heaven's mercy.